Good evening and welcome back to Byline. We took a short break. It's very hot here this summer, isn't it? And, uh, but we're back with uh, a couple of uh, original tapings today. And our first guest is uh, going to be Mindy Dom. And as you probably remember, this is Amherst Media. And this show is called Byline. And it's co-sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters. And it's focused around helping us all uh, keep track of what's going on on Beacon Hill and a town hall uh, locally as we're forming our new government, our town charter is being implemented, and at the state level we have a brand new state representative, Mindy Dom, who lives right here in town, and Joe Cumberford is our new senator from Northampton. So uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, you were on a few months ago and you were projecting forward about things around the budget mm -hmm. and some of the legislation you were working on. So let's, let's just dive right in with the budget because, of course, that's the single biggest product that the legislature has to produce every year. Yep. And our fiscal year begins on July 1, ends the uh, night before June 30th. And um, the governor recently signed it. Mm -hmm. And you get to tell us now the good news and maybe a little bit of not so good news, but hopefully mostly good news. I think it's mostly good news. Good. I think that the budget is a <laughs> phenomenal document this year. It's one that the 3rd Hampshire District, where we are, um, can embrace. And it's one that Mary Mac Valley loves, the Berkshires love, Southeast. It's, it's um, great when you have more money than you expect. And when the governor agrees with your projections. How do you like that? I think that's remarkable. Well, you know, we should explain to the viewers. So there's a process that goes on much earlier in the year. Yes. And it's about December or January. The governor, the House, and the Senate agree on a revenue number. And that's how much revenue do we, we think we're going to take in in the new fiscal year. Right. And then you build your budget around that. But that didn't happen that's, this that's year right. because... Uh, you tell me, sir. Because there was more money than that's, expected. That's right. And I think it evolves. I think that number evolves so that the House, when we start working with our budget, the revenue number, we're dealing with a lower number. And even just a month later, when the Senate gets it, already there are projections that there's going to be more revenue. Right. My understanding is that's why the Senate can actually be more generous because it's using revenue. Theoretically, the governor and the House and the Senate are all supposed to use the same revenue number. Yeah, I'm not sure that works. But then if you're clever, you can find other ways of bumping up the revenue so you can actually spend a little more. And this year in the conference committee, they added some money. They did. And I think, and what was, you know, I think we were all waiting to see, was the governor going to accept those revenue projections or was he going to veto some of yeah. the spending? He didn't veto any a of the A single spending. dollar. Nothing. Which is really shocking. So, you know, people were concerned and I heard from constituents who said, why is it taking so long for the budget? Come on, come on, come on, come on. And I kept saying, well, as long as I, my priorities are in that budget at the end, I'm okay with them taking a long time yeah. to negotiate it. But it turned out that the time they took resulted, I think, in a terrific budget and one that was veto-proof. I mean, yeah. you know, he didn't come back with anything, yeah. so that's a good Yeah, good and, sign. And, and as a Republican and a fiscal conservative, you would expect him to veto, as he has every yeah. one of his previous budgets. He's vetoed hundreds of millions of dollars, and the legislature's done hundreds of overrides. And most of those overrides, the Democrats and Republicans both override uh, yep. the governor. Why? Because they put a balanced budget on his desk, and he wanted to cut. I Why know. do you do that? Right. So today, I mean, this year, he, um, he went the other direction. He went the other direction. And I think what's also interesting is my finger was ready to override, yeah. because I was told <laughs> when the overrides happen, they happen they go really fast. fast. Yeah. Um, but he did not veto any spending but he did apparently um, veto some language, but I have not seen all the, uh -huh. the examples. And I think we're gonna deal with that as a legislature in September. Yeah. Um, and he might have sent back a few amendments as well yes. of some of that language. Yes. So some of those you might be able to work out with him instead of doing an override. So And some of them tell. we accepted on Wednesday. So, yeah. um, we so, so tell us what were the highlights from your point of view, given your district and from your point of view, with regard to the statewide interests? So I had two priorities for the district that I think also impact the Commonwealth, but they were for the district. One was UMass Amherst, mm -hmm. and the other was regional transit authorities. So UMass Amherst, you may remember, the House came out with a budget um, that provided 
um, some funding to UMass as a system that would have not only paid for collective bargaining agreements, which I think has not been done for the past couple of years, as well as some additional money. The Senate came out with a budget that's called for an unfunded tuition freeze, and I put that in quotes because an unfunded tuition freeze, in my mind, it was a program cut because somebody has to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And so if you give UMass an, uh, a requirement saying you can't raise tuition, uh, and we're not giving you any more money, they have to find the money to- And were they borrowing the raise uh, increase in fees or just tuition? I, the Senate's version was tuition. Only tuition. Yes, and okay. it would have cost about $10.1 million to actually yeah. pay for that freeze. Right. I put in an amendment for that, mm -hmm. which was rejected by the House. Yeah. Um, but that was a big concern because that was very two very different budget lines for UMass. And I like to think that, as I said, as long as it took them to negotiate the conference, the result was very good because UMass did not get the so-called codified tuition freeze. This would have been requiring them, not suggesting. Instead, requiring. there's some kind of reporting language. Yes, but the reporting is around accountability, which as a state funded agency they would be subject to anyway. anyway I don't think right. it was anything different. I'm glad they did that yeah. um, because if that satisfies the folks that wanted to do the unfunded tuition freeze, that's terrific. But I'm really thrilled that UMass Amherst will not um, suffer any student service cuts, program cuts, um, unemployment, layoffs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how it would have looked. You know, mm -hmm. We would have seen student programs that are on a trajectory like this having to be truncated. We would have seen people needing to be laid off. That was not something I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So I fought hard for that. Um, I'm, you know, I joined a lot of voices in the House around that, and the House leadership um, wanted to make sure that UMass and UMass Amherst was protected. So I'm thrilled with that. Okay. And regional transit authorities, they had requested about $90.1 million to sustain services. Um, but it looked like it might dip to about 86, 87, and that would have affected PVTA. So right now, the conference committee came out with it at the fully funded, which is the 90 plus million dollars, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean expanded service, it means existing Level service. service, but nothing gets cut. Nothing gets cut, and now we can work on that. Unless they decide this particular route isn't productive and it's better right. to eliminate this route and take those dollars and put it to this other route, exactly. which is more productive, et cetera. Exactly. But, but they don't have to make that decision based on money. money they can make it based on how we service, use the system. Exactly. Okay. Um, and so, and that's actually better because at least if we sustained it, then we can build on that to expand it. Yeah. We obviously need more public transit um, yeah. throughout the state and including in Western Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, so so now this news. was before your time in the legislature, but there was a multi-year agreement to increase funding to regional transit authorities um, by many millions of dollars over about a five-year period. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure this is the last installment, mm -hmm. and so now the, the challenge is to figure out how to get another multi-year increase, and given all the discussion and the debate and the conversation in Boston now about increasing transportation mm -hmm. and how we're going to pay for it this uh, this gives the regional transit authorities and the caucus I assume the caucus is still active mm -hmm. uh, in the building mm -hmm. and so it gives them the opportunity to think about what another multi-year oh, plan yes. would look like and how to make sure that not all the money goes to the T well or use the concern about the T in my mind, to highlight the statewide crisis Need. in public yeah. transit, right? Uh, yeah. And right now, every day in Boston, we hear about either a train is literally falling off the track, catching mm -hmm. on fire, yeah. you know, stuck somewhere and not moving. I mean, there are just, every day, there's like a crisis in that system, coupled with the reps and the centers themselves facing like two hour commutes in something that should take a 30 minute commute mm -hmm. when they're driving in. It takes some of them as long to get to Boston as it does for me. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. And they're 20 miles away. Right. And they're yeah. like, you know, if I leave at 6 at night, I'm home in like a half hour. In the morning, it takes me close to 2. And I actually think those experiences are very valuable to people who rely on regional transit because it's been our experience. Now they're having it too. And I think it opens up the conversation to the crisis in public transit coupled with our concern around climate and trying to get you know people to go into trains, into buses, um, into carpools, I think we're at a great moment. We, you know, as a legislature, we've also passed the fair share amendment twice, mm -hmm. um, which would put a fee, a 4% fee on incomes of over a million dollars, mm -hmm. specifically to go to pay for things like education and transportation. It's not gonna be enough. We know mm -hmm. it's not gonna be enough. So I think we're building 
uh, momentum for you know recognizing we're in a public transit crisis and that's how I'm framing it mm -hmm. so when I hear my colleagues talk about the MBTA I trade their MBTA for one RT and we do you know it's sort of like we kind it's of the raise whole each other Western words. Massachusetts delegation from the Berkshires mm -hmm. all the way to let's say Worcester or so are they all united on a regional vision for transportation oh, and so. therefore organized to basically speak with one voice oh, and I then think so. push to make sure that, for example, in southeastern Mass, they're looking for the next installment. Uh, they got a billion dollars for their south coast rail, but they need at least another billion. And the people up in the Boston area are trying to get trains to Lynn, right. and et cetera, et cetera. Well, what about us? Well, I also think it's not, it's not only about what about us. It's also going to them and saying, here, us too, right? Exactly. It's like and, not but. Exactly. Or, um, because I think that's what I mean. It's like a statewide issue. Yeah. Now they are actually experiencing what we've always experienced with public transit. That's what we have to let them know. Now yeah. you're in our shoes, yeah. right? Um, and I think that, um, I actually think passenger rail may be the issue in the west part of the state that we can, we're all sort of congregating around and consolidating support around. And that allows us to speak with one voice around public transit, whether it's rail, buses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm optimistic. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I saw the governor's uh, transportation plan. He had put a commission together, and uh, he uh, they they published a plan, um, and it's very robust. Mm -hmm. um, it could be a little more robust, but it's a very robust plan. But a very big unanswered question is, how are we going to pay for it? He left that for another day, <laughs> and that's because he doesn't want to talk about right. taxes, and so that means that the members of the legislature have to put on their big boy pants and slacks. Yeah. And, and big girl and pants. Big girl, I was trying to get the slacks in. <laughs> so big boy pants and big girl slacks <laughs> and work on the taxation question. Absolutely. Because you, there's no free lunch. Absolutely. Like, exactly. Gonna, and there we're shouldn't we're, be a free lunch. We're never going to get it if we're not prepared to pay for you it. You know, that's been my thing all along. I'm not afraid to raise revenue. I mean, we have a lot of expenses. And in the 3rd Hampshire District, I hear about those expenses. People yeah. are like, we need education. We need transportation. Somebody's got to pay for it. It yeah. should be us, right? right? It's a public It good. has to be us. Um, I, it's but we also have to push Washington to do their job because the majority of all of the gas taxes collected in the country go to the federal government. Right. And then they get redistributed to the states. That's so, but they haven't raised those in decades, as we hadn't for decades until, what, five years ago, six years ago, and we got a nickel. Well, I'm sort of, I, I'm exploring in conversation with people, because gas tax is something that's being talked about. And in Western Massachusetts, that sort of makes people sad mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because it's a regressive tax. It disproportionately affects people in rural areas. Because um, we drive more we miles. Drive more, and because we don't have public transit, right? Exactly. So yeah. um, it's sort of a vicious cycle. But I'm trying to think of it more as what we need to talk about in Boston is a carbon fee. And we need to talk about it as starting with vehicles. So mm -hmm. a carbon fee, when you think about what is the practice of both, a gas tax and a carbon fee. Someone goes mm -hmm. with, with a car. You go to the gas station, you fill up your tank with gas. If it's a gas tax, you're, t you're a couple cents to 15 cents more a gallon. You're paying for it. And that money goes into the general fund or it goes to transportation. It goes to the highway fund. Right. And, yeah. In a carbon fee, if you're going to be doing that, you go to put gas in your car it's more money per gallon, and that money goes specifically to transportation projects that reduce greenhouse gases, part of it, and part of it comes back to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And in Western Massachusetts, although there isn't really a taste for a gas tax, there is, in the Third Hampshire, strong support for, for carbon. a carbon fee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure what the difference really is if the funds are going into these projects and there's a benefit to the individual consumer. So I'm trying to think, of, I'm trying to raise this with folks in the house mm -hmm. as, have we thought about that this may be a good time to think about a carbon fee? If we don't want to call it a carbon fee, okay, let's call it a transportation vehicle greenhouse gas fee. <laughs> um, but the process of acquiring it seems to be the same as a gas tax, except it's a little bit more targeted to the climate emergency. Mm -hmm. And I think that'd probably be a good thing. So that's what I'm starting to and think And it about. has a secondary benefit because it depresses the demand. That's right. Because 
of the price price point it's a disincentive. as the price point goes up right. other things look more attractive right and so therefore it drives you in the direction of reducing the amount of carbon emitted et cetera, et cetera. exactly it's like what we do with cigarettes right yeah. we raise the tax so that so people don't an, use it and so another cigarettes. variation on that is the reggie yes so uh, reggie for those who at home who don't uh, know what that is it's basically uh, a fee that is attached at the wholesale level mm -hmm to the price of the inputs for creation of electricity right. uh, and for large carbon producing energy systems. And then that money is redistributed right into uh, alternative energy yep. and other ways in which to reduce the amount of carbon that goes into the atmosphere. Carbon fee, tax, whatever you want to call it, slash Reggie is a great strategy for uh, helping the consumers yes. help us with our public transportation and help us with climate change. And I think now they're the, the Reggie, from what I understand, is also a multi-state compact. It's so multi-state, nine it allows, states. Right, so it allows states to do something and not yeah. wait for the federal government. And yeah. right now that's really important. Yeah, because carbon doesn't stay within your boundaries. Right, and I think that they're doing a Reggie now. They're also developing one that may be specific around transportation. There is. Um, so The governor, to his credit, mm -hmm. Uh, signed on to right. this about eight months ago, and within the next couple of years, hopefully there'll be a plan around transportation, Reggie. So, you know, my thinking is it's not just a name change going from gas tax to a carbon fee, but it actually sort of looks at what is the um, impact on the consumer of both, but yeah. how can you maximize the benefit of it? Yeah. Um, and also, how can it benefit Western Mass, right? Yeah. Because um, if you're saying that some of that money is going to go into projects that are going to reduce greenhouse gases and transportation, that could mean more public buses. Mm -hmm. And that gives people more right. options when they don't to want get to get out of the right, car. And, right. Yep, absolutely. So it's um, a cycle that can work for us. Yeah. And it's a values based system, which is different than the, the, than the values upon which our current system is exactly. based. Exactly. And so if you really believe in this kind of decentralization and public transportation, and you want to move in that direction, you have to shift the paradigm. This helps shift the yeah, paradigm. Yeah, and I think there may be support. Like the governor has a bill. He has this climate um, readiness preparation yeah. program that basically he wants funded by a luxury real estate transaction fee. Mm -hmm. That's like a fair share amendment for luxury housing, right? Um, and there are a lot of communities in Massachusetts that want to have a transaction fee on real estate, but they want it to go to affordable housing. But people are thinking about it. That's, it's like a carbon hey, fee. Is he moving toward becoming an independent or something? I don't know. Or maybe I mean, those are very progressive policies. I know. What's he doing there? I don't know. I think it's really interesting that he's thinking about the transaction fee and yeah. climate change because he's saying, I agree with these fees on luxury blank. Again, right? <laughs> to his credit, he's opening his mind and... Uh, looking at other other options, so that's fantastic. Um, so uh, let's go back to the budget. Mm -hmm. um, that was a great conversation, but uh, we need to know more about the budget. Right. You had some local priorities that you so were I was able, able to take care of? I was able to get um, a couple of what they call earmarks. That's special sort of line items for a couple of local places. So we were able to get $25,000 for the Musanti Health Center for some access programming. Um, I was able to get $25,000 in for the Amherst, Pelham, Northampton CCE program, which is um, a project that the three towns are joining together to not only kind of aggregate their energy use to reduce the cost, but to do it with a um, climate emergency in mind and to reduce mm -hmm. their greenhouse gases. And Senator Comerford was able to get an additional $25,000 for that. So we were able to together tag team and bring in 50000 for that project, which okay. is great. Okay. Um, and like I said, even though I wasn't able to get that paid for tuition freeze, I'm looking at that uh, UMass line as another victory because mm -hmm. we, we were able to beat off uh, a severe cut at the university. Mm -hmm. Very good. And uh, so let's shift focus a little bit here. Um, some things passed uh, in the last hours of, <laughs> of the House uh, activity before the, Roland. quote, summer break. Some things passed and so, some things didn't. Yeah, so to tell um, us what happened in the last couple of days. Well, so we did, in the, in the last week of the session, we passed the budget. That's $43.1 billion. And then two days later, we passed a program that the speaker had said he wanted to do, which was called Greenworks, mm -hmm. which is this big program. Um, 10-year, it turns out to be $1.3 billion program that would help municipalities 
do the kind of climate emergency work that they want to do, but they can't afford to do. When he was describing it to the Democratic caucus, which is all the Democratic members of the House, he said that he hears too many times from municipalities that they wish they could do X, Y, or Z, that, but they can't. They're too busy making sure their employees have health care, schools, police. So his idea was this should be a reserve for just municipalities. Mm -hmm. And that passed, and it passed with some amendments that were quite strong, actually. So there's all sorts of funding and programs within that program, mm -hmm. um, ones that support an electrified fleet, like vehicles. Another one that Rep Provo from Somerville submitted an amendment that got passed that's a great one that says the priority will go to the projects that reduce the most greenhouse gases. Mm. So it's not just geographic, it's also yeah. who's reducing the most. That passed last week. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the Senate hasn't acted on it yet, but will. Um, and then we also, they also brought forward a package of bills on children's health and well-being, and that passed the House. Um, and that included things like health insurance for children who are in DCF custody as they age out. So between 18 and 26, making sure that folks who are in DCF custody continue to get their Don't lose health care. Unbelievably important, yeah. right? Yeah. Another one around directories of providers. Um, if you ever tried to reach a provider and they said, well, here's the directory for your insurance, and every person you call, they're no longer there, or they no longer accept that insurance, they have a closed panel. So half the directory doesn't even really exist. It's called a ghost directory. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a part in that bill to require a cleaning up of the ghost directories with the hope that that makes it all more accessible. So you will, will really find people as opposed to uh, sorry, nobody's home. Right, nobody's home. Or we'll be able to document the shortages, which is mm -hmm. what I think will happen in Western Mass. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Uh, you know, the process of cleaning up yeah. will show that it's not just people's experience. It's based it's in data, real. too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think both are real, but it's important to provide both for action. It has other pieces to it around um, mental health access for kids to make sure that they have access to behavioral health programs. Um, and another part that I like a lot, which is getting the Health Policy Commission to assess the needs of um, families who have kids with complex medical needs. These are kids who may be on feeding tubes and wheelchairs and trying to figure out, so what are all the needs these kids have and do we have those resources mm -hmm. for those families? Mm -hmm. And so great piece of legislation. I mean, it took a bunch, of, like three or four bills, maybe even more than that, that had gone through the House, pulled them together and made one package for the end of it. And we were told, like with Greenworks, that leadership's intention was that this would not be the last time we would be dealing with climate change this session or children's health and well-being. So that's good news. Very good. And you've been uh, chasing some bills that you put into the, into the mix. Uh, I remember yeah. one from our last meeting on this show, uh, diapers. Yes. How, how are we doing on the <laughs> diapers? Well, it's so ha I don't know when this show is going to... Um, Tonight. Is it going to show I tonight? Think. I'm not sure. So there's a diaper drive But the happening. people are watching it tonight, and we're on. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, so, yes, I have a bill to create um, with two other um, members of the legislature to create a diaper benefit program uh -huh. in the state yeah. um, because you can't use SNAP or right. WIC to buy diapers. Yeah. We had a hearing. It was a fantastic hearing. Um, the executive director of the United Way of Hampshire County came to provide um, evidence as well as some other nice. folks. Um, and I think the committee is pretty receptive, but we'll see. They haven't polled on it yet, so we don't know what's going on. But right now, in Hampshire County, the United Way is doing a diaper drive. So okay. I think there's like 50 locations throughout the county, and if someone wants to donate diapers that will eventually find their way to like the Amherst Survival Center, the Northampton Survival Center, East Hampton Community Center, you donate to this drive, they'll distribute them. Okay. We did a drive in the House and in the Senate before the public hearing. We did mm -hmm. a one-month drive. We had about 10 collection boxes. President Spoka had one, and Speaker DeLeo had one. I'm not saying there was a competition there, but maybe a healthy competition. Mm. And then at the end of it... Of course, was, there are 160 reps and 40 senators. <laughs> That's so. true. So there was more on the House side. We, we collected more. That's for sure. <laughs> well, we, if you didn't, then shame on that's you. That's true. And I got to bring a lot of them actually back to the Amherst Survival oh, Center because people said, we don't know what to do with them. I said, I know exactly, exactly what, what to, to do, do with them. them. Um, and it was really interesting because the experience uh, of the members who had donated 
It's very similar to the experience that people in our community yeah. have. Their first thing that they said was they had no idea how expensive they were. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing you want people to walk away with when you're trying to do a drive for awareness. Too. Right. Now, I'm recalling also that you worked on a bill that had to do with binary choice on yes. licenses and government applications. Or, yeah. uh, so remind us what that's all about. So that bill is, is known as the Gender X Bill okay. um, because it would provide for a non-binary option on government forms and applications. So mm -hmm. that's driver licenses, hopefully voter registration forms, you know, the revenue forms, all applications, even fishing licenses, uh, would offer an X for folks who don't identify as either male or female. It passed the Senate. I don't know if I was here the last time, if it had passed the Senate. Uh, I don't think so. So Senator Comerford's the Senate sponsor, okay. and she, that thing <laughs> took off, and I think it was like 39 to 1 passed the Senate, which right. is fantastic. Who was um, the one? I think it was. I think we. Never mind. I think it was the senator from Westfield. Uh, and I have okay. no. I have no problem. Hey, if you're going to yeah. go on the record as okay. the one, yeah. it was Senator Hummison. Um, okay. And so, um, it's in the House, um, and I'm. I've introduced that with Rep. Marjorie Decker. It's in a different committee than Senator Comerford's. Hers went through transportation. We sort of really wanted ours to be in state administration because it's more than just driver's licenses, yeah. and we wanted to include more than driver's licenses, and we're hoping for a hearing in the fall. Great. With one minute to go, what are your predictions for the fall? Oh, I think there's going to be more hearings because they didn't get through all their 5,000-plus bills. For higher education, I think we're going to see some legislation around sudden college closures and mm -hmm. what we should do about those. Mm -hmm. um, Very important in our minds here in Amherst because of Hampshire College's situation, yes. which, by the way, is heading in a much, much more positive direction. Thrilled that they're re-envisioning re and moving forward. Ken Rosenthal did a spectacular yep. job. Some of those key alums staff at the college, the faculty, everybody has been engaged. Yes, so we'll see. And I think they'll have a better idea. They have a new president. They'll yeah. have a better idea and within a couple months what that looks like projecting out. Um, but that experience sort of triggered and engaged um, Senator Comerford and myself to really focus on the issue of sudden college closures in a bigger way. We're both on the higher ed committee, so mm -hmm. we had a uh, hearing on it. We brought the commissioner out to discuss it. And I expect we'll probably have some legislation because the governor submitted legislation, which I think the legislature is tweaking and modifying and making better. Well, it's great to have you here today. Thank you, what Stan. a lot of reporting on <laughs> a lot of activity. So thank you very much. And thank you. Thanks for joining us this evening. And if uh, you missed part of this, uh, we're on again on Monday night. So uh, tune in then. Thank you. Thank you again, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.